Hello, and welcome to Wall Street Training's exhibit on share repurchases. It has been said that upon a share repurchase program or the announcement of one, a company's stock price should increase. This can be attributed to three primary reasons why. The first might be a mathematical financial reason explained by the fact that there are now fewer shares outstanding, thereby increasing your earnings per share. Assuming a constant P.E. ratio or similar metric, one could assume that the stock price should increase. Second reason might be a pure economic supply and demand reason. The supply of the available number of shares outstanding has now suddenly decreased, and the demand has also increased based on the company's desire to repurchase these shares. A third reason might be attributed to simply behavioral finance, the signaling effect. Management is signaling to the market that they believe that their stock is undervalued. After all, why would you buy when the stock is high? You would buy when it's low. Of course, this doesn't explain who is selling it back to the company. But in any case, if you look at it from a pure capital markets efficiency theory, if the capital markets are efficient, the stock price should not increase. In other words, said in a different way, the value of the stock, in theory, should not increase based on the mere fact that you're altering your capital structure. To illustrate this particular example, let's turn to our exhibit over here. Let's first say that we have three scenarios here. The first scenario is the status quo scenario. This is what happens if the company were to do nothing. Let us now pretend that the company will use cash to purchase $30 worth of stock, and then let's look at an alternate scenario in, case, in the case where they will use that to repurchase this $30 worth of shares. Starting off with the basic valuation concepts, let's look at total enterprise value. Let's just assume that the total enterprise value is simply $1,000 for each of these three scenarios. Their debt in the status quo scenario, let's just say, is $200, and their cash on the books is simply $50. This gives you an implied equity value of simply $850. How did this $850 come about? Don't forget, equity value plus debt minus cash equals total enterprise value. So therefore, $1,000 minus the debt plus the cash will get you your $850. In the used cash scenario to buy back, again, we are buying back $30 worth of stock. We will now have the same $200 of debt on the books in the used cash scenario because they will use their $50 of stock to buy back the 30, giving them a net $20 of cash, giving them an equity value of now $820. Under the used debt scenario, the debt will actually increase to $200. They will borrow the $30 to fund the repurchase of these shares, and cash, of course, stays constant at $50 from the status quo scenario. This, again, gives you an equity value of $820. Let's take a second to reflect upon this. In all three scenarios here, the total enterprise value has stayed constant at $1,000. This fundamentally assumes that the value of this company itself has not changed. The entire value of the company has not changed based on the mix of the capital structure. The equity value has clearly decreased, and this makes a lot of sense simply because they are buying back $30 worth of stock. Now, if you look at it from this perspective, let's currently assume that in a status quo scenario, there's 100 shares outstanding that gets you simply a price per share of $8.50. Now, if you, were to use the, if you were to buy back $30 worth of stock, exactly how many shares are you repurchasing? Well, you are taking $30 divided by your $8.50 stock price per share, and this gets you to approximately 3.53 shares that you're buying back. Taking the 100 minus the 3.53, that gets you 96.47 shares approximately there. So you have now shares outstanding of 96.47 in both of these two scenarios, giving you a new estimated stock price of $8.50, exactly the same as the status quo scenario under the used cash or the used debt scenario. So again, let's crystallize this. What we have said is that upon the repurchase of these shares, $30 worth of shares in this case here, assuming that the equity, the enterprise value of the company, the enterprise value does not change. Fundamentally, the business itself of the firm has not mod been modified, and therefore, the only thing that has changed is the capital structure. And if the markets are efficient, this should already be priced in. In other words, the value of the stock price should not change, giving you no additional quote-unquote value added to the shareholders. Let's look at this from a second scenario. The second scenario, let's just look at it on how this might affect the income statement and earnings per share. Let's turn back to our exhibit at this point. Using the same three scenarios here, status quo, use cash, and use debt, let's look at how this might be 
affected. Again, status quo, using cash and using debt. Looking at the income statement, let's start off, for instance, with EBIT. When we start off with EBIT, let's currently assume that we have about $100 of EBIT in all three scenarios. None of these scenarios will have an impact on interest, I'm sorry, on EBIT because it is all before interest, and therefore, you can assume that it stays the same. Let's currently assume that we are going to have an interest expense rate as well as the interest income rate of 10%. This 10% we will later on modify to see the difference between the cost of equity versus the cost of debt. But let's go through this simple example first. Let's assume that our interest expense, recall in a status quo scenario, we had $200 worth of debt, $200 and $230. So we will take $200 times the 10%, that gets you $20 of interest expense under the status quo and the used cash scenario. And under the debt scenario, we have 230 now at 10%. That means a $23 difference. Interest income, however, will also be at 50, 20, and 20. 50, 20, and 20. So $50 means plus $5 of interest income, plus $2, and plus the same $5 as in the status quo scenario. This gets you now a pre-tax income, earnings before taxes, of $85 in a status quo scenario if you did not buy back any stock, $82 for both the cash and the debt scenario. They are both the same at this point here because we have assumed the same 10% interest rate there. Profitability has decreased by $3 simply because you have an extra $30 at 10% of $3 and that has impacted your earnings by $3. Let's assume a tax rate of 40%. And when you do the math, $85 times 40% will get you taxes of $34. 32.8 in the used cash as well as 32.8 in the used debt scenario to finance and fund your share repurchase. This will get you a net income of $51 in the status quo scenario, 49.2 as well as 49.2 again under the buyback scenario. Using the same shares outstanding from on top before, we covered 100, 96.47 and 96.47. And when you now do the math and you divide, you have earnings per share of 51 cents and let's quickly check the math here, 49.2, 96.47 will get you earnings per share of 51 cents as well. And this is due to rounding. If you were to use the full significant digits, you would have the exact same 51 cents without rounded to the penny. So now, let's think about this again. Let's summarize this. We have just proven that a 10% interest income and interest expense rate what this means is that your earnings per share also will not be affected in each of these scenarios. But here I want to twist the logic a little bit and say partially the reason why is because we randomly picked a 10% nice convenient flat round percentage. So let's look at now what this means from a cost of equity ROE perspective as well as what this means from a cost of debt. Let's turn back to our exhibit.